Those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Democracy Now!'s Nermeen Sheikh. Thank you, Amy. And welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. The prosecution has finished laying out its case against accused Army whistleblower Private Bradley Manning. Today, his pretrial military hearing enters its sixth day at Fort Meade, Maryland, and the first defense witnesses are expected to testify. Yesterday, the man responsible for turning Bradley Manning into the FBI and Army took the stand. Former hacker Adrian Lamo denied in his testimony that he'd violated a journalistic or ministerial promise of confidentiality when he turned over the chat logs that led to Manning's arrest. Manning has been held for the past 19 months for allegedly leaking classified videos and diplomatic U.S. cables to the website WikiLeaks. On Monday, military prosecutors claimed they had discovered what they believe is email correspondence between Manning and Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks. In one letter, Manning reportedly wrote, quote, This is possibly one of the more significant documents of our time, removing the fog of war and revealing the true nature of 21st century asymmetrical warfare. In another email, Manning reportedly took credit for leaking a video that showed a U.S. helicopter gunship killing a group of Iraqi men, including two employees of Reuters. Monday's hearing had other dramatic moments. The nation's most famous whistleblower, Daniel Ellsberg, was temporarily removed from the hearing after he attempted to speak to Manning. Another supporter, former Army Lieutenant Dan Choi, was also forcibly ejected from the base. It'll be at least a month before the investigating officer on the case decides whether to recommend a court-martial hearing for Manning. If convicted, he could face life in prison, possibly death. To find out more about the hearing, we're joined by the uh, Democracy Now! video stream by Ed Pilkington, a U.S. correspondent for the Britain, British newspaper The Guardian. It's been blogging about Manning's pretrial hearing since it began last Friday, and uh, Ed was there through the weekend. Welcome to Democracy Now! again, Ed. Can you talk about the latest revelations in these two days, Monday and Tuesday, uh, in this Article 32 hearing of Army whistleblower Bradley? Manning. Yes, well, we had, a, uh, on the one side, we had the end of the prosecution case, uh, and in which they were piling on um, evidence that Bradley Manning was involved in the leaking to, to WikiLeaks. And that's what they need to do. They need to pass a fairly low bar in this hearing uh, to show that there is evidence around to sustain a full court martial trial. Um, so that the email exchange with Julian Assange, which they claimed that Manning uh, had carried out from his personal computer is an important part of that evidence. Um, and uh, they also piled on uh, more colleagues speaking about how he was engaged using his computer late at night uh, and how he was showing sort of elements of uh, ill-disciplined behavior. And that's what the defense was picking up through their cross-examination. They continued to try to show that the army behaved negligently in failing to, to pick up on signs of, of erratic and in sometimes violent behavior by uh, Manning in, in precisely the time when the leaks are alleged to have happened. So they continue to make that case to the defense. Uh, and as you said earlier, today's the big day for the defense. They, they will uh, roll out their defense witnesses. Now, this is going much longer than expected. This pretrial hearing was expected to be at the most five days. We're now in the sixth day, and the defense is just beginning. Yeah, well, I think these pretrial hearings can last sort of a very, very long time, and there has been a degree of legal wrangling, particularly at the start, over precisely how many witnesses can be called. It may well wrap up pretty close, um, quickly. It may wrap up today, and that's part of the story uh, for the defence. They are claiming, and their uh, Bradley Manning supporters are picking up on this strongly, that Manning has not been given the right to a fair pretrial hearing because we think they are only likely to be able to call three witnesses. Now, that's in addition to 10 witnesses they shared with the prosecution, but it's still a tiny number compared with the total of 48 that Manning's lawyer, David Coombs, asked for. Uh, and David Coombs' lawyer, who's been quite theatrically sort of outgoing in the, in the courtroom, has made very clear that he's not happy about that uh, in front of the presiding uh, investigating officer or the judge in this pre-hearing. Uh, he said that this isn't fair, that uh, Bradley Manning is being withheld a proper hearing, and that it's crucial to them to be able to 
to, to, to call all the witnesses they wanted to in order to go on, if there is a court-martial trial in the end of this process, in order to have a fair trial. And certainly, it does look odd. We've had about 15 prosecution witnesses come before the court. And if, uh, by contrast, the defence is only allowed to call three of its own witnesses, that's, that, you know, that looks pretty unequal to me. But do you think, is the case, um, is the defense trying to make the case that uh, Bradley Manning was somehow emotionally unstable, rather than relying on the fact that uh, a number of government institutions, including the State Department, the White House, etc., uh, their reviews found that none of the disclosures uh, actually, in any sense, compromised U.S. national security? Well, you know, it is important to say we don't know what the defense is going to do, because this isn't a trial. Uh, what they may be doing is just seeking information that will then help them prepare a totally different defense come a proper court-martial trial. So we don't know what they're doing, but certainly we've had hints about what one thinks must be their strategy. And certainly the instability of Bradley Manning, the fact that he wasn't properly uh, cared for and controlled, is, is top of the list. Um, uh, they have mentioned the fact that government reviews suggest that the WikiLeaks documents were not hugely harmful to, to U.S. national interests. They've mentioned that. Uh, and they have mentioned a few other lines, which perhaps they're going to pick up uh, at a later stage. But it, it, it does seem to be the case that they're focusing on Bradley Manning's state of, of, of mind. And to some degree, that's got other groups angry. There have been comments from gay groups uh, and transgender groups saying, hang on, why are you implying that a gay man is not a reliable uh, security intelligence officer in the army. This is precisely what we've been fighting against under the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy for many years. So why, why are you doing this? So, so it is causing a little bit of, in, of debate uh, among Bradley Manning supporters. The question is whether they're going to argue for, uh, in the actual trial and the court-martial, whether the defense will argue he should be protected as a whistleblower. Perhaps the greatest whistleblower in U.S. history, Dan Ellsberg, was at the trial and says that about Bradley Manning, or that um, he was simply emotionally unstable, that he had punched a superior officer, um, that he had uh, indications of serious mental instability uh, in Iraq, and even before it was recommended by some in basic training that he not be allowed to go to Iraq. Ed. Yes, I mean, the instability line is, is interesting because one can only assume that would help try and get a lesser sentence in mitigation, that it's not going to help make a, a defense of innocence or any other uh, defense that would actually uh, get him off the charges altogether. So it seems to be an, uh, an argument that's designed for further down the line, towards the end of a trial, when you get to the mitigation uh, aspect of it. I mean, they have floated one other thing, which is they have questioned uh, prosecution witnesses about what is the precise evidence that it was Manning himself that used these computers. OK, they were Manning's own computers, but that doesn't mean he was the one who was using them at the time of the alleged leaks. Also, they, they talk about this exchange with Julian Assange having made, been made from a laptop belonging to another soldier. So how come it was Manning who was making that email exchange and not the other soldier? So they have been asking some questions that go to the heart of, was Manning the, the, the soldier involved who precisely made these leaks? So that might become much more important at, at, at a court-martial trial. We don't know. But certainly most of what we've heard from the defense has been focusing on mitigation to get a lesser sentence and not on the innocence, the question of innocence or defense under whistleblowing laws, as you say. Ed, who are the, the witnesses that the defense is likely to call? Well, we don't know because they haven't been telling us ahead of anyone coming into court. I mean, they've been citing security uh, issues. Well, one doesn't quite know what those security issues are, but that's what they've been telling us. We don't know. Um, uh, Manning's lawyer has put out the full list of 48 people he wants to call, redacted, so without any names. And we know that two of them were uh, President Obama and Hillary Clinton, and we know they're not going to get uh, Obama and Clinton. But they also called um, psychologists and psychiatrists who inspected Manning at the time of the leaks and who, according to the defense paper documents, uh, advised that he was in an unstable state uh, and, that and that he should be taken off night shift and taken off secure intelligence work.
Ed, we know you uh, have to. Uh, we know you have to go, but just w two quick questions. One sure. is, what are the media restrictions on the reporters inside this hearing room? Um, and uh, finally, what were you most surprised by so far in the latest days? Well, the media restrictions were very peculiar. Uh, they, we weren't allowed. We're still not allowed to to report or have our. Wi-Fi connection onto the outside world whilst the court is sitting uh, and is open and, and discussing these affairs, which is very peculiar because, like, why would they want to do that? I mean, once our Wi-Fi is back on, we're going to report on them anyway. So there's no conceivable reason why they're doing that to us, and it's very, very peculiar. The most surprising thing, um, I think, has been the degree of shambles uh, at, at high levels in the army in, in running uh, a show at the very heart of the front line of a major war in Iraq. And we've heard a lot about how Bradley Manning was running virtually without any controls at all. And that puzzle, continues to puzzle when we keep hearing more and more information about that. And on a completely different issue, you wrote recently in The Guardian about the EU move to block trade in medical drugs uh, to the U.S. Can you talk about that? Yes. Uh, Britain uh, did this last uh, November, but now it's been spread right across the entire EU. And it's an uh, export control, very, very tight one, on two drugs, pentobarbital and sodium thiopental, which happen to be the only two drugs that are used as sedatives in U.S. executions. They're absolutely essential. Without them, executions in America cannot happen. And Europe is one of the, the main areas in which America gets these drugs. Uh, American manufacturers don't produce them anymore. So, surprise, they're running short. Uh, many of the 34 states who carry out the execution uh, sentence are running low. And this could prove very, very interesting in the few months that, to come. Ed Pilkington, we want to thank you very much for being with us, U.S. correspondent for The Guardian newspaper in Britain. The Guardian is blogging regularly uh, at the Bradley Manning pretrial hearing at Fort Meade, Maryland. Uh, pentobarbital is one of the drugs that was used in the execution of Tri Anthony Davis on September 21st in Georgia. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute with former Lieutenant Dan Choi. He attended the Bradley Manning hearing on Saturday and Sunday, but was banned from returning on Monday. When he attempted to go into the hearing, he was wrestled to the ground, <clears throat> he was handcuffed, and um, we'll talk about the rest in a moment.